All right, amen. Are y'all excited to worship with us this morning? Y'all do not sound very excited about that. Are you excited to worship with us this morning? Amen. Will y'all stand up and join us? This is amazing grace, isn't it? Oh, praise God. Come on, let's give a shout of thanks to the Lord today. Thank you, God. Thank you. 
Worthy is the Lamb. You're in the right place today. We're in the right place today. It's a place where we've come to worship Him. Would you pray with me? Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, we acknowledge you today and we need you more than breath or food or even those around us. You alone are holy and almighty. Touch every soul as your word goes forth today. Let us hear the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let your life course into the deepest crevice of my thirsty and hungry and needy soul and of everyone here. Lord, we thank you for healing, for cleansing, for deliverance that's in your presence. We thank you for all you've done. And thank you for all that you're going to do today because of him. And everybody say amen. amen. Would you be seated in the presence of the Lord? So glad you're here today, uh, especially if you're a first-time guest. I want to say welcome home. Amen. Everybody say welcome home. Welcome, welcome home. home. We're glad you came as a guest, and we hope you'll leave as a friend. There's a Connect card in the seat in front of you if you are a first-time guest. And if you would, uh, please fill that out. Um, if you brought someone as a guest with you today, Please give them that card if they're by you there and then take them to the Connect Center in the lobby after the service so they can exchange it for a gift and a treat. Uh, if you turn in your Connect card there, you can exchange it at the Connect Center. Uh, not only receive a gift and a good homemade treat, but uh, you'll receive a coupon for a large uh, hot and ready pepperoni pizza at Little Caesars. And that's a pretty good deal. It was a great day last Sunday, wasn't it? We had, uh, amen, had about 300 folks here. I think it was 298, Pastor said. Uh, but we, uh, this is another day. It's a day the Lord has made. It's a good day, and we're going to baptize some people. Pastor, you right ahead. Well, good morning. I'm so glad you're here. Let me tell you the wonderful thing about last Sunday's services. Now, let me go ahead and help some of you because you're already starting to get emotionally down because you don't see the same nearly 300 people that we had last Sunday. Well, not even the mega churches, the big mega churches across the nation will have the same congregation that they had last Sunday. But here's the thing we should know and understand. That number tells us what the potential is for our church. That's where we're going. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right. It's water baptism time. Who's first today? All right. Yeah. Miss Dottie Tires. <laughs> Come on in. Come on down. The water's right. It's about like bath water. Might even be a little too warm. Yes. All right. One more step. All right. Now turn and sit. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. We're so grateful for you, Miss Dottie. I know that last Sunday during the spoken ministry time, the Lord was really ministering to your soul. How many of you remember the sermon illustration I shared towards the end of the message about the little boy in the house fire? And his daddy was telling him, son, you've just got to jump. You can't see me, but I can see you, and that's all that matters. Miss Dottie came up to me right after service. And I could tell the Lord had already ministered to her, and she had already been up for prayer. And... Uh, Right after service in the lobby, she came to me with tears welling up in her eyes, kind of like right now. Yes. And, and she said, Pastor, I jumped. <laughs> Praise God. If you haven't jumped yet, let me encourage you to jump into the arms of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Maybe you can't see him. Maybe you don't understand this whole Christianity thing. But I promise you, he sees you and his power to catch you is greater than your power to tie knots in your life and try to hold on to a rope you can't see. Amen. You can Amen. trust him. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm almost like preaching, so I need to stop preaching and start baptizing, right? Like John the Baptist. <laughs> All right, I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you very quickly. 
Do you believe that Jesus Christ, as God's only begotten Son, paid the full penalty for your sins on the cross? And do you confess him before this congregation as your personal Savior and Lord? Yes, I fully do. Amen. Praise God. And I love you all here. You're a wonderful family. Sorry. Number two. Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave so that you can rise to a new life and live for him? Yes, I do. Amen. Completely. Praise God. Well then, because of your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your determination to follow him, I baptize you in the name of the Father. I sense a moving of the Spirit of God up here. Wow. Praise God. Wow. We got one more. Praise God. Sister Wanda Pacheco has been with us for several months now. She is the straight across the street neighbor of Miss Sharon Collins. And after Miss Sharon's insistence a couple of times, Wanda decided she was coming to church. And um, Wanda hadn't looked back since then. She made a profession of faith in Christ, and now she's ready to seal the deal and let the whole world know that Jesus Christ is her Lord. Praise God. a short word of testimony you'd like to share with the church today? I don't think anyone could possibly know. On earth, all things have seen, things have done, but through it all, he never left me. He knew who I was and he called me by my name. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, as God's only begotten Son, paid the full penalty for your sins on the cross? And do you confess Him now before this congregation as your personal Savior and Lord? Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave so that you can rise to a new life and live for Him? She's certain about this. <laughs> well then, because of your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your determination to follow him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
most marvelous thing about last Sunday is after we received in all of our connect cards and processed everything, we had at least 12 people make commitments to Jesus Christ. That's something to give God praise for. Hallelujah. That means on their connect cards, they either indicated a first time commitment to the Lord or they want to recommit their life to following Jesus Christ. So that's powerful. What does that mean this morning? That means we're going to be doing a whole lot more water baptisms. Amen. I love water baptisms. Praise God. And before I hand the mic over to Pastor John, let me just pull on the heartstrings of some of you men who are carpentry minded. We're not too far away from me assembling a team so that we can actually mount this sucker in the stage. Why is that important? If you've ever tried to get this thing back and forth from one building to another and get it filled with water, you'd understand, but we're going to get it mounted and we're going to get it plumbed and get it hardwired. Praise God. Amen. Pastor John. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise again for what he's done what he's doing and what he's going to keep doing. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm up to receive, uh, up to lead us in our time of giving. Amen. And our tithe and offering. So uh, ushers make ready to receive our tithe and offering. And uh, later in the service, after our worship uh, songs, we're going to be receiving a, a, uh, a resurrection offering, uh, a time of sacrificial giving. So be prepared, uh, be praying about that. But I want to talk about, man, you talking about responding to the gospel. Amen. Miss Dottie, the first one being baptized, she gave her life to the Lord last Sunday. I called on Monday, and I, I'd say, I, I see you gave your life to the Lord. and want to know if you want to be baptized. She said, I don't know all about baptism, but I'm willing to be baptized. She said, I was raised Catholic, and I don't know anything about it. I say, if you're willing to come to our class on Wednesday and be ready to be baptized on Sunday, we can get you baptized on Sunday. She said, I am willing. And God is looking for people that's willing to change their plans and change their schedule and make him a priority in their life. Amen? Amen. And you couldn't imagine the time we had on Wednesday in our baptism class. It was a time of celebration, a time of weeping, I mean, crying out before the Lord. We had church in baptism class, amen. And it was because of their hunger and their willingness to the Lord, amen. So I just want to encourage you that if you hadn't been baptized, it's not too late to be baptized. And it's a time of celebration, amen. Let us celebrate with you and encourage you in, in, the walk, in your walk with God. Uh, Proverbs 22, 9 says, he who, is gener who, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these generous people. We thank you for their generous hearts, God. We thank you for your generosity toward us. We thank you for giving us so much, giving us forgiveness hope, joy, peace, salvation. And Lord, as we give you a token back of what you've given to us, Lord, we place it in your hand, Lord, that you may bless it and break it and make it more than enough to meet the needs of your ministry here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And let everyone say amen and amen. Yeah. 
has overcome. Come on. And mercy triumphs. And with the third day dawn. And darkness was eaten on when the storm was gone. And unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. And impossible things. Shall be done. And unstoppable God, let that your glory go on and on. And impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Come on, put your hands together. This nothing shall be impossible. And nothing shall be impossible. And your kingdom reigns unstoppable. And we'll shout your praise forevermore. And Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. And we'll shout your praise forevermore. And Jesus, our God, come on. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. And we'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, one more time. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Let your glory go on and on. And impossible things in your name, they shall be done. And unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. And impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Give him some praise.
and you work and you are and you'll be forever the king your throne and glory is splendor holy holy lord you are holy Jesus, you're guiding me into your will, into your will. Come on. If all of the heavens are singing along with the saints and the elders, and glory is sung and the praises you sing never seem to get old, then I'll stay it forever to sing it. And holy, holy. I see glory as I run inside the throne room and before you and I bow, I bow. The veil is torn and the doors flew wide. I see glory as I run inside the throne room and before you and I Give him some praise. Shalom. Now great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. 
inspiration I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written in Jesus Christ my living could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame and the cross I spoke in and I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own A beautiful Savior And I'm yours forever In Jesus Christ am I living God. And hallelujah Praise the one who sent Seal the promise Your buried body Began to bring Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory Let's continue to declare victory in the house. Amen. Let's continue to declare victory in this place. 
Jesus Christ, I live in hope, a hope of glory. He is in this place, ready to change lives and set the captives free. Amen. You may have your seats in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Amen. I'm, I'm up to lead us in our time of giving, our resurrection offering, so our ushers make ready to receive uh, that offering. The uh, song before that was Throne Room. Throne Room. And uh, as I was listening to that song, I believe the Lord spoke to me and said, ask the people if they was in the throne room, in my presence, what would they offer me? What would they give? What would they willing to sacrifice and offer me if they was in the throne room? And as you can uh, consider that in your hearts, consider that in your minds, I want to uh, ask you, I want to make mention of our, the trophies here. Hey Amen. Uh, uh, our youth, I mean, it was here on Wednesday night. Everybody was here on Wednesday night. Hey Amen. Y'all saw our youth perform for our talent quest. On yesterday, uh, our youth went to uh, Gr uh, Greenville, Alabama, and uh, competed in talent quest. And everyone that completed, competed won first place. Hey Amen. We're in first place in our talents. Hey Amen. I know a lot of them uh, are next door in children's church, but if you're here and you competed, can I get you to stand? Any, anyone in the, if you're here? All right, we have a couple over here. Hey Amen. Many are our volunteers in our children's church, and we thank God for you. And, uh, and, and volunteer in our children's church or in, in, in children's church. And one of the things we're going to utilize this resurrection offering for is con uh, continued renovations of our buildings and our, our uh, children's church. We want to relocate children's church from here to over to the other building, or the main building, where they have a, a larger playground they can play. And we plan on doing a lot of renovations with that. And so that's what we're going to be doing with our resurrection offering in uh, Exodus 35. And four, Moses, it reads, Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is a thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whosoever of a willing heart, let him bring an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. And it went on. It was actually to build his house and build his tabernacle. And the next the next chapter, it said the people were so willing to give, the carpenters and the, the builders had to come and tell Moses, stop the people from giving. They gave too much. And I, I pray that's the case uh, today as we continue to give. be more than enough to meet the needs of what we're trying to do here at Harvest. And I believe the seams are going to bust here. Amen. As we continue to be excited about God. I mean, let us pray. Father, we just truly thank you for this opportunity to give to give sacrificially, God. You being the example of you give your son and your son gave his life, God. And Lord, as we give sacrificially in this offering, Lord, we pray that we place it in your hand and it's more than enough. And we, Lord, I proclaim today because of your presence, this is holy ground. And because of this opportunity to give, Lord, I pray that it's fertile ground that as they give today, they will plant a seed in the fertile ground that will produce a harvest, God, that the households in this household would not contain it. And I have to pronounce that blessing now over these gifts in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray and let everyone say amen and amen. Man, this, I believe this offering is going to be continue to be open uh, till Mother's Day. So if you don't have anything to give today, be praying about that. And until Mother's Day Sunday, we're going to keep this offering open until Mother's Day. Amen. Let's give a hand as our pastor comes to deliver the word of God. Let me uh, remove some of the kryptonite out of the pulpit. Mm -hmm. 
So, how many of you have ever been married? How many of you are married now? How many of you know somebody that's been married before? How many of you understand marriage ain't always a picnic? It ain't always like a walk in the park. And so, what the Lord laid on my heart some time ago is that we need to just talk about some things in regards to love and marriage in an open fashion. And um, I will just go ahead and solicit your prayers as we continue through the month of May in this sermon series. Um, believe it or not, there is that much to say about love and marriage. But specifically, if you're a part of the pastor's prayer force, would you pray for me in the coming weeks as I'm preparing each week to share in this time? Uh, of course, uh, I'll go ahead and caution my wife. There probably will be a little bit too much transparency for our marriage uh, during this time of sharing. <clears throat> but the reality is... Uh, love and marriage is, is sometimes difficult. You'll notice on the promo card, uh, we worded it like this. If you're single, if you're married, if you're divorced, or if you're just confused. Anybody ever get confused about marriage? Love and marriage as a whole? I mean, there's a reason why social media has that option that says it's complicated. I mean, I've been wonderfully married for many, many years, over a quarter century, and there's still some weeks when I feel like this is complicated. You know, just about the time you feel like you're getting your feet up underneath you, I hope there's somebody here who understands what I'm talking about. Just about the time you feel like, hey, I think I got this thing figured out. I feel like the Lord has really given me some insight. I really know this woman. Then I'll hit a rough patch one week, and I feel like, Lord, it's complicated again. Take me back to school and show me, Lord. Teach me how to love the wife that you've given me. Anybody had to pray that prayer? That's a good prayer, man. I want to encourage you to begin to pray that prayer. Teach me how to know her, uh, to love her the way that you love her. Amen? Well, I'm going to have to make a confession as I get started this morning. Um, I struggled with this first message, trying to figure out how I was going to title my thoughts for this first sermon. Um, of course, you'll see by the slide here in just a moment that the title that I want to use this morning is The Choice is Yours. The Choice is Yours. However, the first title that I had in mind didn't really make it even all the way to the design, the graphic design stage, because it was going to be a little bit too graphic. So even though I can't really use this title because it wouldn't have made good graphic design, this message this morning, though it's titled The Choice is Yours, the subtitle is, you picked that booger. <laughs> now you know why I couldn't go with that as the primary title. So, so like if, if you're not married today, if you're single, if you're young, or maybe you're divorced and you're thinking maybe someday it will be God's will and I will get married, well, I have to tell you, the choice is yours. If you're already married and you're kind of complicated, it feels complicated, it feels confused some weeks, I got to tell you, you picked that booger. Next time you complain about your spouse, you just need to remember, you picked her, you picked him, it's yours, you made the decision. This morning as we look to the word of the Lord, I want you to look with me to James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, I'm going to take a reading from verses 16 through 18. And then of course, I'm going to ask you to take a reading yourself of Genesis chapter 24 at home. Now, why am I asking you to take a reading of that by yourself at home? Well, it's 67 verses. And I didn't want to read that many verses to you all at one time. That's how long Genesis chapter 24 is. It's 67 verses. It's a wonderful story. You need to read that story of Isaac and Rebekah. It'll take you all of 10 minutes at home. And believe me, I, I just know that you've got 10 minutes to spare for the Word of God. Christians who have the best marriages make time for the Word of God. That's free. It ain't even in my message notes. James chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Father, we're so grateful for the word of the Lord today. I thank you, Lord, for the thoughts that you've laid upon my heart to share with your people, and we thank you for the written word of God whereby we draw heavenly principles. And now we pray, Lord, help us to receive the living word of God to make application to our own lives, Lord, that we could have healthy marriages, that we'd have stronger families, and that you could build your kingdom here through us all. For it's in Jesus' name we believe. And everyone says... 
praise God. Thank you so much. You could tell I was struggling. Thank you for watching me drink water. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> how many of you are thirsty now? It's like, some, could we all get some water? Uh, well, how many of you believe in the concept of soulmates? Please don't raise hands. Here, here's the reality. Um, um, he told me that just a little too late. The concept of soulmates is so romantic. It's so cute. I've been married long enough. I've done enough weddings. I've done enough premarital counseling. Let me tell you, this whole Hollywood notion of soulmates, that there's somebody made for everybody, that, and when I really marry my soulmate, my life is going to be so full of happiness. There's a technical term for that, hogwash. I love that concept. It makes for great movies, don't it? Anybody love chick flicks that talk about the soulmate and, you know, the somehow fate and destiny draws them. They're different lifestyles. They're from different blocks, different sides. But somehow destiny draws them together, and it's love at first sight. <laughs> That's great for a movie. Makes a few bucks. Life ain't that simple as a movie, though. And the Bible does not support this notion that there is somebody made for everybody, that everybody has a soulmate. And all the single people said, okay. All the divorced people said, am I in the right house? Y'all got to help me. Loosen up and be real, and the Lord's going to really help us, okay? So here's the deal. The only scriptural support I can find where God ever made one person for another is in the Garden of Eden, and it's called Adam and Eve because God saw that Adam was lonely, and God already made up his mind even for the fall. This man can't do this by himself. He's got to have some help, and he made Eve for That's the only scriptural basis we've got for thinking that God has made somebody for everybody. The rest of that stuff is just kind of like foolishness. It's romanticism. Anybody here a romantic heart. Y'all like romantic ideas. I raised children to be lovers and not fighters. If my oldest son and his wife were here, Alex would be glad to testify to you and tell you that I have told her on more than one occasion because she's come back to me with a little bit of a complaint. She said, he won't even fight with me when I want to argue. I said, baby, I raised a lover, not a fighter. You may fuss all day long, but he's still going to love you. That's the reality. We need to understand what it is to be a little bit romantic enough to understand that it takes two to tango. It takes two to five. You don't have a really good blow up in a relationship unless both parties get involved. But don't it really make you mad when they won't fight with you? <laughs> when they just sit there and smile and, and keep talking sweet, refuse to raise the... You can't even have a good argument when somebody does that with you. I'm a romantic at heart. <clears throat> I wish the concept of soulmates was true because I have actually told my wife on more than one occasion, honey, God must have spent a little more time on you. When God saw me, I know that God made you for me. I mean, I can get so romantic. I'm the God that when I'm really wanting to be romantic, I can quote the lyrics to songs from the last four decades and really just pour it on. <laughs> but listen... That's good for the good weeks. That's good for the good days. But then there's tough days. Then there's those days when you're like, why does she look at me like that? You know, why do you, why do you look at me in that tone of voice? Yeah, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about yet. Some of y'all thinking, well, I want to get married one day, but now the preacher's changing my mind. Uh, at the same time, I can tell you, marriage was like the second best decision I've ever made in my life. The first decision was to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Second to that, there's no other relationship, no other decision I've ever made in my life that compares with the decision to ask this young lady to marry me. Yes, I am a romantic at heart. Hopefully I'll get a few points for those last few sentences. Amen? Y'all believe in praying for the preacher? Come on. i got to go home after this sermon today. So here's the deal. But there is a concept of soulmates that I want you to understand and accept. And what is that? That is the fact that even though there are, there's no scriptural basis, there's no foundation for believing that everybody has a soulmate. Here, here's when you get the soulmate. The soulmate is after you're married. 
When two become one, then you accept that spouse as your soulmate, and you understand now two are one. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I must understand as married people, we have to fight for the oneness of our marriage. We have to invest in it. we got to pour our life into that other person because if you don't fight for that oneness, Satan loves to divide families. Has anybody noticed how many folks get divorced and how quickly we can get divorced at the drop of a hat? I mean, I understand why those young people are coming up, millennials coming up and growing up. I understand why they're so slow to get married. I understand why a lot of folks are waiting until they're nearly 30 years old to get married. And how many of you got married when you were a teenager? Anybody here? Anybody else? Lisa was still a teenager when you got married. Okay, I was too. But the reality is, I understand when you see how hard marriage is and you see how that some of our friends and relatives and some of you even have been divorced. And, and divorce is ugly, ain't it? Can we be real? Divorce is not pretty. They come up with a concept they call no contest divorce. But I'm going to tell you, it's a contest and everybody loses in divorce. The reality is, though, God don't hate divorced people. God loves divorced people. God don't like divorce, but God loves divorced people. And if there's a stigma that hangs over you, you feel like, hey, I, I can't do it. I can't move forward in life. I, I, I'm, I'm no good. Nobody will ever accept me because I've had so many failed relationships and so many failed marriages. I need you to understand something. God is able to forgive the sins of divorce. God is greater than your past mistakes. God is greater than your past relationship fails. God is able to restore you and help you to be whole and help you to have a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me move forward. I met a lady one time at another church who uh, she really could have used this sermon series when she was in her teens. She had been married four times. She recently got married to the funeral home director. But in her 20s, she got married and she outlived a banker. In her 40s, she got married and she outlived a circus ringmaster. In her 60s, she remarried a fourth, third time and she outlived a preacher. When I asked her about her marriages, she explained it this way. She said, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four. How many of you were into that thing, oh, hook, line, and sinker? You're like, <laughs> <clears throat> we got to laugh a little bit through this, okay? Because if it laughs, if you can laugh along with the whole process of love and marriage, it will hurt a lot less. And let laughter be good medicine for your soul. From Genesis 24, I want to derive a few principles right quick again. I'm not reading that long passage of 67 scriptures from Genesis 24, but I'm encouraging you to go home and read Genesis 24, the story of Isaac and Rebekah. So now while soulmates are not made per se in heaven, we see that if we'll follow the right principles, God wants to guide our steps and they can be right. So who am I talking to today? I'm talking to those who aren't married who hope that one day I will get married well then what you've got to understand how to do is follow the right principles if you'll follow the right principles you can become the right person in your marriage you can become that person that God wants to use to help your marriage to become a healthy marriage it takes both of you but somebody's got to have the courage to get started but if you're not married and you've got to find the right person well, you got to become the right person to start with First of all, we find with the right priority, if you really want to get married and you really want to have the Christ-centered marriage, how many of you want to have a good marriage? Anybody here just looking for an unhealthy marriage? <laughs> if you need an unhealthy marriage, I can't help you. I mean, just go do whatever feels right, and this, you know, maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. Uh, maybe you're going to have a disaster. But if you really want to have a God-filled, healthy marriage, which I believe everybody intends to, nobody starts off in marriage saying, Preacher, could you help me? I want to have a rotten marriage. You know, usually people come to me as preacher, could you help me? My marriage could use some help. Or, Pastor, we're going to get married. Could you give us a little bit of counseling? Because I want to have a good marriage. I don't want my marriage to end quickly, and I don't want it to end in divorce. I want to have a good, healthy marriage. And if we'll follow the principles I want to share with you, first of all, you'll find that there's the right priority. God must be at the center of your life. Now, how many of you understand something about priorities? Anybody here understand priorities? Like tomorrow morning, what are most of you going to do? Somebody said, go to work. Why? Why you want to go to work? Got to eat. <laughs> yeah, because I made a commitment. 
and, and you know what? I agreed that for a certain wage per hour or per day or per month that I'm going to show up at such and such a time. How many of you going to go to school tomorrow? Why are you going to go to school? Huh? Why are y'all going to school? Parents going to make you? How many of you want to go to school tomorrow? How many of you just wish it was already Monday? I got no takers on that one. Here's the re <laughs> But you know what? We can do what we want to do. I made up my mind a long time ago when folks started laying out, on, lay, laying out of church and becoming not really committed. People do what they want to do. People go where they want to go. And there ain't no need me trying to make people feel guilty. Ain't no need me trying to layer stuff upon people. If they want to get a commitment to attendance to the house of God and to a relationship with Christ, then they can do that on their own. I'll pray for them, but I'm not about to pass out judgment and condemnation. Here's the whole heart of this sermon series on love and marriage. I am not here to pass out condemnation and judgment upon you. I promise you for any problem you've ever had in your marriage or any difficulty you've had in love and marriage, I've probably been there. Me and Lisa have been there and done that and we know how to pray for you but we promise not to ever pass judgment upon you for the difficulties of life amen well we find in this chapter Genesis 24 that Abraham realizes that his son Isaac it's time for him to get married Isaac is grown and Isaac's uh, ready for marriage and uh, Abraham is going to help him understand the culture of that day meant that they prearranged some marriages but when Abraham took a look around at the people of Canaan where they were living he thought oh no ain't none of these women <laughs> not even in the right ballpark for my son can y'all identify with that <laughs> Anybody ever thought, no, 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 that ain't even the right choice? Any parents in the house? You know, you, you looked at that one and you thought, mm, I don't know, but son, we're going to keep praying. Uh, you know, maybe that's not. And so Abraham looked at all the women of Canaan and decided, you know what, there's not one here that even is even on the radar for my son. These are some ungodly women. And so he gets his chief servant, he calls him into him, and he begins to talk to him. Let me look to you and read to you from Genesis 24. And I want to share with you verse 7 from the ESV. It says, The Lord, the God of heaven, this is Abraham talking to his servant now. He says, The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife from my son, for my son from there. So Isaac is scripturally is known as the child of promise. And the promise to Abraham from God Almighty is that through Isaac, your seed's going to be blessed. You're going to have so many children, Abraham. You want to be able to count them all, all the children that come out of your seed, but it's got to come through Isaac. Isaac is the child of promise. Well, that means Isaac's got to have some babies. And if Isaac's going to have some babies, he needs to have a wife. And so when it's time to go look for a wife, Abraham sends his servant back to the country from whence they came. Go there, and I want you to look. And I will tell you what's going to happen is that I've already prayed, and I trust God in this thing. The Lord is going to send an angel before you, and he's going to help you. And so Abraham is seeking God. God is the center of his life. But then we find Abraham's servant understood that, you know what? I believe I can count on the God of Abraham. And Abraham's servant prayed this prayer when he gets to the country from which Abraham had come. And it's a very detailed and trusting prayer. He prayed verses 12, 13, and 14 of Genesis 24. He prayed, O oh Lord God of my master Ham, Master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Did you notice the details that he asked for? It's not like some general prayer, God, would you please guide me to the right woman? Lord, would you just help me to know in my heart of hearts which one is the right woman for Isaac? No, it's like, God, I want you to send her up. I, I want you to pick her out. And, and Lord, as soon as I talk to her, if, if, it's, if this is the one, let her respond favorably when I ask her for a drink of water. And furthermore, let her be the one that will even go water my camels. Let her be the one that's showing hospitality. And I'll know 
know that you've already went ahead of me, have heard and answered my prayer. I know that's the woman you have for Isaac. So we see what Abraham is doing. We see what his servant is doing. What is Isaac doing? We find towards the end of Genesis 24 that Isaac is also a man of prayer. What he does in the evenings is he'll go out and sit in the field and he'll meditate. He'll pray. He'll talk to God Almighty. Can I tell you, if you really want the marriage that God wants you to have, God must be at the center of your life. I've spoken to you before about priorities. We should avoid priority lists as Christians that go one, two, three, four, five. And, you know, that's so easy to get out of order. If you really want a godly marriage, Christ must be at the center of it all. What you mean, preacher? Most of us learned in elementary school something about the solar system. And we understand that the planets stay in orbit around the sun. So here's how your life should work. The Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself, should be at the center of it all. And your relationships orbit around that. Because when you try to play this balancing act where you're juggling this on a one, two, three, four type priority system, all you're doing is confusing yourself and something's always going to be dropped. There's always going to be something that you feel like you're giving more attention to than the other and you'll condemn yourself continuously. How do you know this stuff, preacher? Man, I've been trying to juggle ministry and marriage for a long, long time. And I finally gave up trying to think that I was always going to get it right. There's just some weeks where I know I give ministry so much more time and attention than I do my own marriage. But you know what? Because we're both right with God and Christ is at the center of our lifestyle this week where she's okay with that. And when she's not, she lets me know. And that becomes the red flag. Like, okay, I need to delegate a little bit more. I need to trust the pastors and the staff that God's given me a little bit more. I need to back off just a hair. And I need to give more attention to the wife that God gave me, the wife of my youth, and be more attentive to my own marriage. Stop trying to juggle everything. Just put Christ at the center and let everything rotate around Him. Let it be in orbit around your relationship with Jesus Christ. Keep Christ as the center of your life. But then let me talk to you about the right patience. It's one thing to have the right priority, but what about the right patience? Anybody here want some patience? <sighs> Three or four of you were you know, courageous enough to say, yeah, that's me. The rest of you are like, I don't know about all that. Patience has a way of being a tough teacher, doesn't it? But here's what I want to tell you about patience. You need to learn how to slow your roll and pray. Anybody understand what it's like to roll downhill? Anybody ever get in a tire as a child and you you get down a little hill? I know this is Florida and it's so flat, but, you know, if you find a good hill as a child, let me find me a 10-year-old. They're all in children's church. And you get in this old tire, make sure it ain't got none of that nasty water in and and you get a couple of your buddies to hold you steady, and then they push you, and you'll find that the closer you get to the bottom of that hill, the faster and faster it feels like it's rolling. But here's what I'm telling you. you got to learn how to slow your roll. Slow down just a little bit. Seek the Lord. The right patience, James tells us about in James 4, verses 2 through 3. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Or other English translations say the lust of your flesh. I'm convinced that most marriages start a little bit too quickly because most couples, most unmarried couples are not as interested in a lifelong commitment to one another as they are their own lust of their flesh. I know nobody's going to be honest and confess that today, but the reality is we're not as interested in the lifelong commitment of love as we are just hoping that I've got this marital bliss. As soon as I marry my soulmate, everything's going to be right in the world. It's almost though they got this soundtrack in the back of their minds. They can hear birds chirping. It's a beautiful day always. They hear that song, and I think to myself, (laughs) that's called honeymoon, baby, but it don't last forever. The honeymoon don't last forever. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I just saw somebody on this side of the room over there say, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. Anybody else over here? Honeymoon don't last forever. Okay, okay. Keep preaching, preacher. Get back to your notes before you get in trouble. So here's what I mean when I tell you you need to learn how to slow your roll and pray. I mean, if you're married, you're never going to have the heavenly marriage that God wants you to have unless you learn how to become a person of prayer. What you mean? Because you're going to need a lot of prayer. I mean, you yourself. I, somebody said, yeah, I pray for that person all the time. I'm not talking about you just praying for your spouse. I mean, you're going to need a lot of prayer because you've got to learn how to forgive. And you've got to learn how to forgive like often. 
And then you got to learn how to forget the stuff that happened years upon. Anybody ever been in a fight and somebody bring up what you did like 15 years ago? And you always, oh, hmm. ladies and gentlemen, statements like you always in the midst of a heated discussion will get you in trouble so fast. Go ahead and clean that one out of your vocabulary. <laughs> act, like, act like you don't remember nothing past 6 a.m., okay? <laughs> but today, see, today is all that really matters. And see, what the deal is, we're so focused on trying to remember the things of the past and what's always happening, and you always, and, and she always looks at me, and she always does this. And listen, here's the deal. As long as you're stuck in the past, you can't really live in the present. And then some of us are so bound by the past bondages of life, we won't let them go, and that we, we get so upset and anxious about the future. We're thinking how horrible the future might be for us if we don't start getting this right right now. Well, here's the way God created you. Uh, I had this revelation with one of our pastors just a few days ago. Um, the Lord spoke to my heart. God did not design us to live in the future. God didn't make you to live in the past either. God designed you to be able to live in the present. And anytime you're reaching backwards or you're reaching forward and you're trying to grab a hold of stuff in the future and you're thinking about it and trying to plan it out and you're getting all uptight and you're getting nervous and you're getting worried, you want to know why that brings so much stress upon your life, upon your soul? God didn't make you to live in the future. You got no control over the future. You got no control over the past. Can't do nothing about what's already happened, but you can handle right here, right now. By the grace of God, you can make sure that you act and you react appropriately with your spouse. Somebody elbow your spouse and say, Amen. <laughs> what do I mean when I say slow your roll and learn how to pray? I mean, if you're divorced, please slow down. Take a little longer. Ain't no need in making them same mistakes again if you're thinking about getting married again. Make sure you get it right. Work on you. Become the spouse that's like so centered in Christ that if you're going to get remarried, somebody's got to be seeking first the kingdom of God to ever even find you and ask you out. What does it mean if I'm single? It means I've got to learn how to be a person of prayer and I've got to be so prayerful about people that I will go out with. If I'm single and I'm looking to get married, it means I've got to be careful about people that I will allow myself to get emotionally close to. Does this make sense to anybody? Learn how to slow down. Parents, are you already praying for those future spouses for your children? How many of you got young children that aren't married? Anybody here? You got some children that ain't married? I want to encourage you right here. Uh, if there's one piece of advice me and Lisa would give you today, listen, go ahead and pray for those children's future spouses right now. But preacher, I don't know who they are. I don't either, but God does. Somehow God knows the future just as well as he knows the present. And the reality is, as parents, you need to go ahead and begin to pray and trust God for those future spouses. Go ahead and pray that God would help that person to have an experience with Christ, get drawn to the center of his will, and grow and develop as a believer in Jesus Christ so that at that point in time, when your person, when your child is seeking the face of God, they'll be able to find that spouse that's supposed to be theirs. You can ignore this advice if you want to. You, matter of fact, you can ignore the eventuality of puberty and the hormones and marriage if you want. Don't even pray about it. And just see, come back and talk to me 20 years from now, and I'll be having to counsel you and pray with you for your, spy, your children. The reality is you can never begin to pray about this too soon. So you need to slow your roll. And here's the deal. If you're divorced, what do I mean when I say you've got to slow your roll and pray? I mean, you need to slow down. Statistically speaking, and I'm not telling you, most of you anything you don't know, there's such a greater percentage that you're going to get divorced a second time if you remarry. So that means you got to make sure you're like all grown up and matured and that you've made the right, best possible decision according to God and His Word. But here's the deal. Most of us don't even care what God and His Word thinks before we get married. We only want what we want. And when the pastor says, okay, I won't mind doing your wedding, I'll be glad to officiate that, only if you'll agree to some premarital counseling. And guess what happens when I tell most people that? They roll their eyes so hard you'd think they're stroking. I'm serious. I've seen some major eye rolling going on before. And typically, they let me down off the hook pretty easy. Well, you know what's okay? I got a great uncle who's twice removed. I, I think he's a preacher. 
And I'm okay with that because if I can't help you to have the best possible marriage possible, I don't want to help tie that knot in front of God and all them witnesses. Is that okay with everybody? Oh, I love to be a part of weddings. I, I really do. But, but I want to help people make sure that they're where they need to be. Here's what I've discovered through premarital counseling. If I can help talk you out of this thing, <laughs> you ain't mature enough to be married no ways. Because what I do in premarital counseling is I begin to uncover and unearth some issues. You think, I know them so well. And you've been, you know, why wouldn't you? I mean, you've been dating them for all of three months. <laughs> but when I begin to really ask some heated questions, you know, I mean, you don't even know what their favorite color is. I mean, come on. It gets real deep and it gets real hard. How many of you are married and over the last few minutes you're thinking, I wish I had talked to the preacher before I got married. You're thinking, maybe I didn't do such a good job. Maybe I didn't make the best choice. Well, let me remind you, you picked that booger. You picked him, she picked you. You both agreed to it. The choice was yours and you made it. And so what that means right now, that two have become one. You are soulmates right now and you made an agreement before God and your spouse and you said, till death do us part. You ain't dead yet. I'm not recommending homicide either. I'm saying there's a better solution. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not recommending divorce either. What most of us need to do, if you're married here today, slam the back door on divorce. Take that word out of your vocabulary. Understand that you made a commitment before God and there's no personal offense. There's no personal offense. There's no personal sin against you that you can't forgive unless you refuse to forgive it. I know because I've been there and I've done that. I'm glad my wife's a timid person. She doesn't yell amen a lot. I've given her so much opportunity to yell amen, praise God. <laughs> She's sort of a bashful worshiper and she doesn't get very vocal in her demonstration of agreement with the messages. She will help me later today though, I promise you. Let me move to my next principle. I've talked to you about the right priority and the right patience, but let me talk to you about the right place, and I won't spend very long on that. The right place is where the right person is found. Abraham made up his mind. Canaan is not the place, Isaac, for you to be finding a good woman. Matter of fact, we've got to reach deep back into the home country to find the kind of woman that you need. Listen to me. I want to help you. Abraham was an old person. Old dude. I mean, he was old before Isaac was born. He's so much older now. Young people, you need to learn how to listen to older people. I know some of them don't seem like it, but they've gotten some wisdom. Have they got? See, here's the deal. The reason they're so much smarter than you as a young person is because they've already made so many more mistakes than you have. And they've learned so much from those mistakes that it pays you to listen to them. Lean in and listen to Pastor William for just a minute. I want to help you. I promise you. I'm your pastor. I love you. I'm praying for God's best for you. You will never find the right person in the wrong place. I don't have to go through that laundry list of the wrong places, do I? But let me tell you the right place. The right place is to find that person that's hidden with God in Christ Jesus, who's, who, whose life acts like they don't even have time for you. You think they're playing hard to get, but what it is is they've already been taken. They've been taken by a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you'll find that person, and you can finally convince that person to give you the time of day, then you've got an opportunity to have a good marriage. Amen? Let's move from the right place and go to the right personality. Somebody said, personality? I'm more about what she looks like. I know that's always a cop out. Say people say, but she's got a good personality, and you think that really means that there's a, that's being disrespectful toward a person's looks. Ah. Again, listen to the old dude holding the microphone. Okay, every one of us, if we have enough birthdays, are going to get old and wrinkly. Okay. You, what you really want is a nice person to live with for the rest of the days of your life. Because it don't matter what they look like, you know what? If they ain't good to live with, if they ain't nice, your life is not going to be like made in heaven. You're going to regret the day that you said, I do. 
So the character traits of that person's personality matters more than anything. What do we learn about this marriage in Genesis 24? We learn that here's Isaac and Rebecca, and Rebecca, when she's found and she's finally agreed, she's already said, yes, this is what I'm going to do. Her family, her household says, you know what? This appears to be of God, and, and we're going to release her to go marry her husband, Isaac, and, and she's coming back. And as soon as they approach the field where Isaac is out there meditating, what, what Rebecca does, she says, who's that? And she finds out who it is. Oh, that's your intended spouse. So she pulls a veil and covers her face. What's the chief characteristic we're talking about here? We're talking about a little bit of modesty. And according to culture and time of that day, what we understand is most likely Isaac never even saw Rebecca's face until after they were married. We've carried that tradition into our modern day, haven't we? Anybody, any brides here in the house? You ever been married? Did you have a veil at your wedding? And you had that veil down as you marched down the aisle. And it was not until the preacher said, you may now kiss the bride, that the veil is lifted up. We, we primarily brought a little bit of that into our custom and day. But notice something else about Rebecca. I love this about Rebecca. Oh, the servant is there, and he's brought 10 camels with him. By the way, that's smart. Still waiting on my dowry, son. <laughs> y'all don't, don't understand the concept of a dowry? <laughs> I used to joke with Jeremy about the dowry. I'm still waiting on the dowry. and he, he understands that my sense of humor is not that great. I feel like some of it's even rubbed off on him. I mean, he lived with us for four months. So nonetheless... Uh, beyond that but so here is the servant of Abraham he's going with dowry in hand and he's got ten camels but these ten camels after they've been on this long trip they thirsty do you understand that the average camel if it's really thirsty can drink 21 gallons of water but what does Rebecca do she says hey you get a drink of water and I'm gonna go fetch some water right now to give your camels drink as well so potentially on that day when she met this servant she didn't know that marriage was even in play at the time she potentially drew up 210 gallons of water from a well to go drink give drink to thirsty camels what does that tell us about her characteristic not only does she practice modesty she's strong Young ladies, have you toted gallons upon gallons of water? Do you understand how heavy that can be? I mean, to feed 10 camels, I mean, to give them water, perhaps 21 gallons apiece, even if it's only 10 gallons apiece, 10 times 10 is 100 gallons. That meant that she's carrying about 800 pounds. Not all at one time. But she's stout, she's strong, and she's hospitable. She's not the kind of young lady that's only concerned about what she looks like and, and is so consumed with her phone that she's got to take 15 selfies before she can interact with you. You know, one or two every now and then is okay, amen? But here we find that on Isaac's checklist of characteristics, he must have wanted a girl that had a servant's heart. Can I tell you, being servant-hearted, is great for a spouse. As a matter of fact, I would have you to know, those of you who are already married, that a Christian wife is continuously, the New Testament teaches this principle, a Christian wife is continuously looking for ways that she can bless her husband. That's the mark of a godly woman. But it's also, now before you throw anything, it's also the mark of a godly man that a Christian husband is always looking for a way, an opportunity to be able to bless his wife. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Can I talk to just the men for just a moment before I kind of bring this home and close? Men, you've got to take the lead. Be the man of God that he's called you to be. Get up, go to church, read the Bible with your family. I mean, learn how to grab your spouse's hand sometimes and say, baby, we, just, we ain't going to worry about this. We're going to pray. Let's, let's pray right here, right now. If you're not there, you can get there, okay? I promise you, every one of us has got to grow and every one of us has got to start somewhere. But I'm telling you, men and women of God, if you really want to have a heavenly marriage, you take the responsibility yourself and you become the person that God has called you to be. In closing, somebody said, I'm glad he said in closing. Don't you like it when the preacher says those words? The hardest part about love and marriage is what I want to tell you right here, right now, at the very end. I've told you the choice is yours if you're single, but here, if you're single and you're wanting to be married, then the choice is not yours alone. 
you could be following all the right steps. If you're single or divorced and you're looking to get remarried, you could, do, you could get it all right that I've told you and then it turn out wrong. Why is that? Because if you're, if you're looking for a spouse and you're seeking God, God could tell you, could indicate to you by the power of His Holy Spirit, no, that's not the one. Or what if the intended partner, the person that you want, says, no, what do you do? Anybody here ever had their heart broken? What do you do then, preacher? You've got to trust God's plan. You, you've got to hunker down even more and seek the face of God. Seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness. And if you'll find yourself, find yourself hidden with God in Christ, eventually He will help you have that desire for marriage fulfilled. But you can't be focusing on the marriage, on the relationship. You can't be red hot going after everything with two legs. What you've got to do is slow your roll, patiently seek the face of God, and let God take care of all things in His time. He makes all things beautiful in His time. Today, I want to encourage you to understand this. If your marriage is not where you want it to be, God makes all things beautiful in His time. But you've got to be a willing participant of this. If you're married and you're confused or you're struggling, I just want to remind you, you chose that person and they chose you. Maybe you need to have 30 seconds of reflection. Remind, remind yourself what it was about that person that you loved in the very beginning. Think on that. Dwell on that. And then pray that you'll become the spouse that you was in the very beginning that made them choose you. Would you stand with me all over the house? Love and marriage is not all fun and games, but it does take a sense of humor to be able to deal with it. I want to encourage, first of all, Christians in the house to understand during this invitation, it don't matter if you've been married one year or 25 years, you need prayer for your marriage. It needs to be covered and bathed in prayers. Anybody like me been married at least 25 years? Can I see some hands? Would you agree with Pastor that you have to pray about your marriage? You have to pray for your spouse. I want to encourage you. Would you lead the way today when I begin the invitation? Would you begin to seek the face of God, not just for your own marriage, but for the other marriages in our church family and in your families? I want to invite you to do that. But if you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm single or I'm, I'm divorced and I'm hurting, would you seek the face of God? God wants to help you. God wants to bring healing. You see, there's wholeness on the other side of that difficulty. There's a healing that God has for you emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. But you see, you're going to have to make Jesus Christ number one in your life. You're going to have to let Him be the center and begin to seek His face with heads bowed, with eyes closed. Today, if you're here, you'd say, Preacher, I'm not right with God, and I, I need the Lord. I want to have a Christian marriage, but I'm not a Christian. You're in the right place, friend. It's time for you to commit your life to Jesus Christ. Like so many people did last week, I invite you to come to an altar of prayer. My prayer workers are coming. And I want to invite you, if you're not a Christian, or you'd say, I'm backslidden. Or you'd say, I'm, I, I know what it means to be a Christian, but I'm not living the Christian life right now. Friend, if you're ready, God is ready for you. Would you come? Would you come and seek the Lord and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner but I trust you as the Savior of my life. Friend, if you'll ask the Lord, He'll save you gloriously, and you can be born again into the kingdom of God. While these are considering their option to commit to Christ or recommit to Christ, I want to ask married couples, would you lead the way? Would you begin in this time of prayer to come and let's seek the face of God for our marriages?
Jesus Christ and my living God. And you could imagine a so great a mercy and what heart could fathom such boundless grace and the God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame and the cross has spoken and I am forgiven and the King of Kings calls me Christ and my living God. The hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. My living hope and hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. And my Seal the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise your very body and begin to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion and declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory but that's okay. We don't have a second service. This is so important because Satan hates marriage. When Satan wants to divide a church and he wants to bust up a church, you know what he does? He attacks homes and families. He gets in the midst of a marriage. Why? Because the church is made up of homes and marriages, homes and families. So just please know in the coming weeks, I'm going to be praying for your marriages. And I'm going to be praying for some of you because you're, you're seeking for God's will. And you know you've got to make some changes. Don't allow today just be something you heard. Would you please make application out of some of the principles you've heard that the Spirit of God has spoken to your soul about. Make application in your own life. Don't let it just be, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't good. 
let godly sorrow produce repentance in your life. If you know there's some changes you got to make, like humble yourself and make them changes. I can't tell you how many times I've had to repent before my own spouse and God and say, forgive me. I didn't do right. But if you'll give me another opportunity, I'm going to do better. I thank God for a forgiving spouse. And the Lord has heard and answered those prayers. How many of you filled out those surveys we passed out there for a while? Some of you filled those out. Some of those surveys are still out in the lobby if you'd like to fill one out. I don't know exactly how I'm going to address this series over the next couple of Sundays. I do know the final message in this series on the fourth Sunday of May, the title of the message will be, Survey Says, and I will address some of the questions and answers that you've given me anonymously, by the way. Uh, we will protect the names of the innocent and the guilty. <laughs> Praise God. I'm so glad you're here. Please invite somebody to be back with you next week. If you're here today and you've made a commitment to Christ or you've recommitted your life to Christ, please indicate that on one of the yellow connect cards. Turn that in so that we can follow up with you and help you to know those next steps to following Jesus Christ. Don't forget, next Sunday we're doing baby dedications, so we're looking forward to that. That's a big day. And so we're looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday and then again the following Sunday. Let's look to the Lord as we pray and dismiss today. Father, we're so grateful to have been in your house. Father, today as we leave, we can truly declare it has been great to be in the house of the Lord. And so, Father, I pray, bless marriages, strengthen the families of this church, help the single people, Lord, to know your exact will for their lives. And, Father, help those who have no desire for marriage to understand that that's okay and that they're still whole in Christ and you love them just as much as you do any married person. Father, for those who are divorced, those who are confused, those who are struggling and not currently married, I pray, bring wholeness, bring healing to their lives, and we'll trust you for it and give you thanks for every evidence of it. In the strong name of Jesus, you may be dismissed in that name. Amen. Thank you.